Well, uh, good evening. And how are you this evening? Well, I want to welcome you. I want to welcome you and thank you for either tuning in or attending my 16th and final State of the City Address. Now, I know a few uh, clappings and I'm glad it is last one. Oh. <laughs> but, uh, but I appreciate it, I really do. Uh, you know, when I made my announcement that I was uh, not going to run for another term, I said that this is a relay. It's not a sprint. Meaning that no mayor starts and finishes this race. Instead, they just run their leg in the race and they pass on the baton. This, however, assumes a purpose and a clear direction. And for me, that has always been to leave this city better off than I found it, position the city of Cleveland for a sustainable future, and move the city down the path of being a great city. Right. A great city where all share in the prosperity and quality of life. To do, to do this requires basic things that have to be done, such as sound fiscal management, quality and quantity of service, economic growth and job creation, quality education, Amen. capital investment in our infrastructure and equipment, and safe and clean neighborhoods. Now these are just some, just some, of the basic things that have to be done and are necessary to have a successful city. In order for that success to be sustainable, however, we must become a great city and grapple with the underlying core issue of institutionalized inequities, disparities, and racism. Now, every mayor inherits good things. They inherit challenging things. And they also have an opportunity to do their own thing. And when you, and in this game, in this game, when you become mayor, all of that belongs to you, no one else. The good, the bad, and the opportunity to do your own thing belongs to you. With the knowledge, however, that there's a crisis just around the corner that if you don't handle it properly, it will destroy all of which has been accomplished. And that will be true for the next mayor of the city of Cleveland. Same as it was for me and every mayor before me. So let's talk about the race that I own, the race that I have run, and most importantly, the baton that I will be handing off. A baton that will give the next mayor the tools to build on the good, to address the challenges, and to be creative in, in the opportunities that they will have. I'm go not going to go into a lot of details. While a lot has been done over the last 16 years, I will only give a snapshot of what I have been handling, hand, of what I will be handing off to the next administration. Now let's start with fiscal management. Now we are 1.8 billion, this would be, municipal corporation, with around 7,000 employees full time. Uh, around a thousand seasonal, temporary, and part-time employees, as well as contract with vendors to provide consulting and technical services. As a municipal corporation, our bottom line is not profit, it is service. The city measures itself based on how it delivers that service 
in quantity and in quality. There are two major categories of this $1.8 billion budget. The general fund and our enterprise funds. Now, the two major enterprise accounts are utilities and the airport system. Now, what is the financial status, viability, and quality of service of our utilities? Now, we have water, water pollution control, which is our local sewer system, and clean and public power. Each have a cash balance that allows them at this time, at this time, to be stable and healthy. But there's always concern about how do we position them in a way that they can provide the quality and quantity of service its customers deserve while maintaining rates that are affordable. And water, over the last nine years, we have had six years of zero rate increases and three years of modest rate increases. In the last, the last four years of that, however, is currently in Cleveland City Council waiting on passage. That is, three years of zero rate increase and one year to fourth year of a modest uh, rate increase. Capital investments in the water plant and the automatic meter reading technology has allowed for uh, fewer estimated bills, a monitoring of water use, a greater efficiency and a high quality product, which is the water, as well as better customer service. The Division of Water will have a projected ending cash balance of around $163 million. And over the last 16 years, there has been over $1.3 billion invested in our infrastructure, vehicles, equipment, our plants, our facilities, and technology. Now, water pollution control, which again is our local sewer system, has an old infrastructure. And we are in the process of repairing and upgrading that infrastructure. There's a need for a rate increase going forward for water pollution control so that we can continue to have this utility viable for the future. That too is pending in Cleveland City Council. Water pollution control would have a projected ending cash balance of around $22 million. And over the last 16 years, uh, there has been over $138 million invested in infrastructure, vehicles, equipment, uh, plants, facilities, and technology. In clean public power, we are currently analyzing our infrastructure and, uh, on, and how to build out that infrastructure to be uh, a more competitive utility. Cleveland Public Power was the main driver of our LED initiative. And that's where we replace all of our street lights with LED lighting. Uh, this is designed to re, uh, re, uh, produce a reduction in the cost of our electric power for street lights and also provide better lighting. Because LED also allows us to have instantaneous knowledge of when lights are out, uh, that allows us to respond more efficiently thus providing better customer service. A clean public power will have a projected ending cash balance of around $30 million. But there will be a need for a rate increase in the future to ensure the financial and operational soundness of the utility. Over the last 16 years, there has been over $180 million invested in our infrastructure, vehicles, equipment, our facilities, and technology at Cleveland Public Power. Now, our airport system is a major, uh, another major uh, enterprise uh, fund, uh, 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 and uh, Cleveland Hopkins International and Burt Lake Fund Airport were significantly impacted by the pandemic. It resulted in fewer people moving around and traveling and, and uh, with a loss of revenue associated with that. Now my direction uh, uh, has been and continues to be to position our airport system 
of his birth to be competitive in the airline industry regardless of what happens. Mm -hmm. Example is when Hopkins was a hub for Continental, and now United. And we were prohibited at that time from courting or marketing other uh, 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 our airport to other uh, carriers. Uh, now, without Hopkins being a hub for United, now we're allowed to you to market our airport to other airlines, and as a result of that. Our airport has had a higher number of passengers and at a lower cost of travelers. In 2019, over 10 million passengers were served at Hopkins and in Berkeley. 10 airlines provided services to over 53 destinations in, in the United States, Canada, Mexico, and the Dominican Republic. With the onslaught of the pandemic, however, these numbers dropped to 4 million passengers and as few as 32 destinations. In 2021, we are on track to have 6.8 million passengers, with that number going to an increase into a projected 8.8 uh, .8 million in 2022. We are currently at the 44 destinations, and we are projecting more for next year. Hopkins has improved to an A bond rating, and we are completing our master plan that will allow us to plan for the future and remain competitive. Burke Lakefront Airport serves corporate and general aviation. Burke also serves as a destination, uh, a designated uh, reliever airport for Cleveland Hopkins International Airport. Now, since 2006, there has been over $620 million invested in the infrastructure, venues, equipment, facilities, and technology, and the airport system has about $100 million of projected unencumbered balance going forward into next year. The general is supported by tax revenue as compared to the enterprise bonds, uh, which are supported by fees for service from customers. Now, the general fund is greatly impacted by external factors, whether they are governmental policies or economic downturns. Example, the recession of 2008 and 9, and the state reduction in local government funds in 2010, as well as the elimination of other tax revenues for local governments, all resulted these economic and government imposed factors resulted in the loss of over $200 million to Cleveland, resulting in a need for in-tax income tax increase in 2016 uh, to help to uh, balance out our general fund budget. The pandemic is the latest factor that has affected our general fund budget in terms of our revenue. Now, throughout all of these challenges, however, the city of Cleveland has been able to balance its budget as required by law, provide services, and maintain a workforce with minimum impact to our employees. As a result of the Recovery Act, the City of Cleveland is able to replace lost revenues and recover costs related to the impact of the pandemic. This has positioned the City of Cleveland well. Here are some of the general fund things that we, are, we will be passing on to the next administration. A balanced budget with a carryover of over $100 million. Now, that's a lot of money, but remember, this is one-time money and it should not be used as if it was a continuing revenue stream, right? And so it should be used properly, and proper use of it should allow for the city to hedge against a possible economic downturn next year as well as make strategic one-time investments. 
will increase, will they have an increase in our rainy day fund to $45 million. Now this, this will help with our bond rating and the cost of borrowing. Over $10 million will be available in restricted income tax, now which gives the capacity to borrow for capital needs. Over $26 million of self-insurance funds, and that will help pay, that will pay for the medical and prescription costs for all of our employees. In addition, in addition, the Recovery Act allows us to appropriate money for uh, five million dollars to the Greater Cleveland Food Bank, uh, twenty million dollars to provide broadband to uh, Cleveland residents, thirty-six million dollars to public safety for vehicles, equipment, and technology, fifteen million dollars for demolition, and around eighty million dollars, eighty million dollars to invest in development, small businesses, and service to people affected by the pandemic. This too will need to be appropriated by Cleveland City Council. In May of next year, the new administration, the new mayor, and the new council will have the opportunity to do program and appropriate an additional $255 million of the Recovery Act. So one way, one way in which we measure quality of life is, is through public safety, particularly in terms of crime, especially uh, violent crime. Violent crime is a major problem not only in Cleveland, but throughout this nation. Now, in an effort to deal with the increase in violent crimes, we have reorganized many of our specialized units within the Division of Police. And we also collaborate with our federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies, which has allowed us to address violent crimes, narcotics, firearm trafficking, violent fugitive apprehension, gun suppression, straw purchasing of firearms, disruption and dismantling of firearm trafficking schemes, and identification of illegal firearms and reviewing of shooting scenes so that we can identify trends. Our task force and our partnerships extend beyond the region by addressing cartels, and gangs in narcotic laundering operations. We supply Cleveland and Northeastern Ohio with huge amounts of narcotics and guns. The use of these collaborative efforts has allowed the Cleveland Police Department to seize over 2,300 guns so far this year, which is an increase of 41% over last year. The Division of Police has charged over 3,600 felonies offenses, which is a 20% increase over last year. It seized 2.3, over $2.3 million of drug money, tens of thousands of grams of illegal drugs, conducted 40 homicide-related search warrants, made 57 homicide arrests and cleared uh, around 60% of the homicide cases. Now, despite, despite these record-breaking statistics, things will get worse unless we take some immediate actions in regards to the availability of guns. Now, I'm not talking about gun control. I'm talking about responsible gun ownership and close the loopholes that allow for the trafficking of guns in certain communities, whether they're legal or illegal. These are state and federal policy decisions. And without immediate action at the state and federal level, we will continue to see an increase in violent crime. Now, we are aggressively recruiting 
Uh, since 2017, the Division of Police has graduated 11 uh, police academies, and we have a 12th one in session now. Since 2017, the Division of Police has placed uh, 440 uh, new officers on the street. 36% of those officers were minorities. Candidates are currently being vetted for our lateral uh, uh, transfer, lateral academy class, uh, class 149, and we're taking applications now for, uh, for academy uh, class 150. We're also supporting enforcement efforts through the purchase of vehicles, equipment, and technology. And we are adding $11.7 million of recovery money in addition to what we're already doing. Enforcement is the immediate response needed to combat crime, but enforcement alone cannot solve crime. Crime is a symptom, a symptom of underlying causes and illness. These underlying causes have to be addressed in order to reduce crime and to have a sustainable effort towards the elimination of crime. This is long term, but is essential and a necessary approach. We have established several things to help with the prevention side and addressing these underlying causes. We created the Office of Prevention, Intervention, and Opportunity for Youth and Young Adults focused on connecting youth and young adults with support systems, uh, su uh, jobs, and resources, and education. Re-entry is a major part of this. We have also uh, transformed our 22 recreational centers into trauma-informed neighborhood resource centers and expanded programs beyond the traditional program. All staff members have been trained to identify trauma and toxic stress and will continue to get trained. All of our resource centers are staffed with social support service specialists. Their job is to help identify victims of traumatic experiences and then connect them and their families to the support that they need. We, also, we are also doing professional development at our resource centers. We are collaborating with Cleveland State, Kent State, Case Western Reserve University to assist us in developing uh, and delivering our comprehensive leadership program and establishing some basic standards. And we are putting in place a new assistant director, assistant commissioner of the Division of Recreation, whose sole responsibility will be looking at their resource centers and helping to evaluate whether or not they are performing. Now overall, overall the city and the division of police have made significant progress in terms of the consent decree, including the development of major uh, policies and procedures, as well as implementation, uh, implementing training on the use of force, community engagement, and problem solving, bias-free policing, crisis intervention, search and seizure. Data suggests that the men and women of the police division are engaging meaningfully with these new policies and training as they go about their job on a daily basis. We are currently embarking on a new phase of implementation and performance measures. The division officers are receiving training and instruction in various mental and behavioral health issues. There has been a significant increase in the use of reported de-escalation techniques by the division. Use of force has decreased by 23% from 2019 to 2020. Firearm pointing has also decreased by around 34%. Other areas include search and seizure, investigatory stops and arrests. The division has developed a five 
uh, integrated policy governing such uh, uh, encounters. All of the policies and related trainings have been approved by the court. The division has developed a database that will collect wide, a wide variety of information on all vehicle and investigatory stops and searches. The division will also com uh, has also completed uh, and the court has approved a comprehensive plan related to equipment and resources. All of this will enable the division to collect the critical data it needs to establish compliance with the consent decree. While much more needs to be done, much has been accomplished. And since 2017, we're switching gears now, 2017, we're going to the fire division. In 2017, the Clean Division of Fire has graduated a total of four academy classes with the fifth one in, currently in session. Uh, there are 219 firefighters put on the street uh, since 2017. And uh, through uh, recruitment efforts, we've continued to increase diversity in the fire division with 28% uh, minorities in the current fire academy along with eight females. <laughs> now, the Division of Fire uh, obtained uh, uh, ISO 1 certification. Now, what does that mean? And how important is that? It, the Division of Fire is one of seven fire departments in the state of Ohio and just one of 389 fire departments of out of 40,000 fire departments in this country who have achieved that status. The division has opened up uh, some years ago, Fire Station 36, and we, we currently are developing uh, a new station, Fire Station 26, and, and we purchased a, a marine boat, uh, a, a maritime boat. In addition, we opened up a suppression unit, suppression unit uh, company in uh, Gateway Entertainment District, uh, and we will be spending $11 million of the Recovery Act dollars uh, to, uh, will be used to purchase additional equipment, a uh, vehicle, security, and rescue materials, and new technology. Now, the Division of Emergency Medical Service, EMS, uh, they have graduated eight academy classes and one is currently in, in session. These academies have a diversity of 27% minority. As a result of the passage of Issue 2 in 2016, which was an income tax increase, the division of EMS was able to hire an additional 72 people, purchase nine new ambulances, open up seven new EMS locations, and increase the number of ambulances both on a day and evening shift. Now, this allowed EMS to, uh, one, reduce response time, but also it helped EMS secure the Ohio State Emergency Medical Technician Training Accreditation, which allows us to now hire, train, certify, uh, and, 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 and cadets and candidates to become EMT, and we can do all of that in-house. Now, in addition to police, fire, and EMS, we are, will be giving over a half a million dollars to our uh, animal care and control and we will be investing another five million dollars in the phase two of our safety police camera program. Now, uh, there's been significant uh, improvement in our school district. Now, prior to the pandemic, our school district ranked in the top 15 percent uh, in Ohio for improvements in K to three. Uh, it also ranked in the top 4% for improvement in the state of reading and math exams. Since 2012, the Cleveland Plan for Reform has helped the school district graduation rate go from around 52% to 80%. 
Now, this statistics uh, meant that Cleveland has the fastest uh, graduation rate improvement among all Ohio school districts during a 10-year period. Now, African-American students have an uh, 80.9% graduation rate. Uh, Hispanic students achieve an uh, 82.6% graduation rate. Uh, this means that our children of color are uh, graduating nearly six percentage points higher than their peers statewide. So, now, although uh, our school district has gone from an F to a D in grade, and, and these it made these improvements and many others, uh, they are not yet where they should be, or will they will be in the future. We still have work to do. The Higher Education Compact was formed in 2011 and helps to place uh, our graduates in college and provides them with the services they need to be successful. Now there has been an increase in the number of students who uh, finished the first year of, of, of college and an increase of 12%. An increase of college completion rate in a, uh, about 4% for four-year colleges and 15% for two-year colleges. Now, Say Yes Cleveland provides scholarships, tuitions, and support service. And these support services provide, are provided for a family support specialist, both in our school district and in our partner uh, charter schools. Say Yes uh, Cleveland is a collaboration between the public and the private stakeholders. Now, since 2012, Voters have supported three operating levy and one capital campaign. The last operating levy, issue 68, was for a 10-year period. That operating levy was vital to our school district to be able to continue the progress that it has made under the Cleveland Plan. In fact, in fact, the voters and the citizens have given us everything that we asked for, and so they deserve the results that they expect. And if you know, our public school system is an important board with a joint appointment between the mayor and the board of the superintendent. The board and the superintendent are committed and they're dedicated to education and to our children. So this, the education of time is funded it, it, and it has plans and resources and opportunities going forward. Now Cleveland is well positioned for the future well positioned financially and operationally. And that will only be sustainable if we're able to have economic growth and equitable prosperity and job creation. That means that means that positioning Cleveland for the future with strategic investments. Now let's start off with the Wolstein project. The Flat Sea Spain project. Now that project put to rest the question as to whether or not Cleveland could develop its waterfront. Mr. Wolstein's vision made future waterfront development possible. Without it, we would not have plans for future waterfront development. The Cleveland Brown plan for the lakefront looks to the future. Now we're investing two and a half million dollars in a study to determine the traffic flow, uh, moving the shore away, and creating a, a land bridge to connect all of downtown Cleveland to the lake. Greater Cleveland Partnership has agreed to take an initial coordinating role to develop the public, private, and civic partnership structure that will be that will be needed to enable this vision to progress. 
The partnership is working with my, my administration, hopefully the next administration, and the Haslam uh, Sports Group, and engaging public, private, and civic stakeholders to create a roadmap that will be necessary to advance this vision and bring it to fruition. The vision for the valley, that is the Bedrock Project. This project will be, if the Bedrock Project is part of the vision of the valley, and it will be a mixed-use project that will not only connect all of the previous investments that we made in the Cuyahoga Valley, but also connect downtown to the riverfront. A plan for the future that will redefine the river valley and bring great energy uh, for investments and people to an old industrial valley. We are investing in the future of all Cleveland neighborhoods. We, uh, this, uh, the political conversation has always been downtown versus neighborhood. That's pure politics. We're talking about Cleveland. And you can't have one without the other. You can't have one without the other. And sometimes one comes before the other. But you can't have one without the other. Let's take examples of neighborhood, uh, of planning. Uh, East, 76, East 72nd Street along the Lakeshore will be a $300 million mixed-use development plan, which includes a 150-acre new lakefront park. The neighborhood, the neighborhood Transformation Initiative invests in the physical, economic, and social infrastructure of the neighborhoods of Glenville, Buckeye Woodland, Clark Fulton. We have developed plans for the target areas around the Opportunity Corridor, and we're working with local uh, uh, development corporations to acquire land and working with the state of Ohio to ensure the necessary infrastructure improvements that we need and that they are made so that we can encourage new develop development along the corridor. We're continuing to invest in our trending neighborhoods, neighborhoods like Little Italy, Tremont, Ohio City, Detroit, Shoreway, Larchmere, and others. Now these neighborhoods actually are growing in population and they become destinations. We are investing in our middle neighborhoods to stabilize them, maintain the market value, and prevent them from declining. Specifically, we are providing resources and targeting investments in the neighborhoods of Collingwood, Old Brooklyn, Bel Air Curious, Mount Pleasant, Lee Harbor, now HUD has awarded a $35 million Choice Neighborhood Implementation Grant to CMHA, Cleveland Metropolitan Housing, County County Metropolitan Housing Authority, and the City of Cleveland for the Buckeye Woodhill Transformation Plan. <laughs> this transformation plan includes new housing, streets, public space, and program. The Department of Community Development is working on a 10-year housing strategy for all the neighborhoods of the city of Cleveland that looks at the housing product and affordability. The Department of City Planning will init be initiating the 21, 21st Century Cleve Comprehensive Plan. Now this is a, a new citywide plan that is coordinating with our partners to create trails, green space, uh, 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 diverse modes of transportation, new zoning code, and, and much more. All designed to position and create a city for the future. As you know, 2020 was a year that not many of us have ever witnessed before. Uh, I know I ain't been old, I know about somebody else. <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it meaning that it's, uh, since the pandemic, uh, the, uh, 
Spanish flu pandemic in 1918, uh, the city of Cleveland and the nation never witnessed the impact of a virus like we witnessed this coronavirus since then, since 1918. The pandemic has had a significant impact on all aspects of our social, political, and economic lives. With the new variances and a large number of people unvaccinated, we are at risk of more significant negative impact. In an effort to protect lives and stop the spread, we did several things uh, 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 last year. In March, on March 11th, of 2020, I issued the first of several uh, proclamation of civil emergency for the entire city of Cleveland. On March 12th, next day, we formed the Internal Civil Emergency Executive Policy Group. Now, what this group does is uh, it oversees conditions during the civil emergency and makes recommendations uh, on additional actions that need to be taken as a result of the pandemic. All city buildings were closed to the public on March 17th, 2020, and an appointment only process was put in effect for permits, birth and death certificates, and other uh, information needed by the public. From mid June of 2020 to July of 2020, the city experienced the first of several surges in new cases. On July 3rd of 2020, a mandatory mask mandate for the city of Cleveland was issued for all individuals in public or uh, in the public or public spaces, including uh, bars and restaurants and other businesses. Uh, after peaking in mid-July, of last year, Cleveland's seven-day incident rate began to decline. So it peaked and then it began to decline for 14 weeks. And then in November through January of this year, we saw a new surge where we had 1,900 cases in one week, new cases in one week. And then from January of this year to March of this year produced another increase in new cases. So there were multiple surges going on and eventually it began to decline again in mid-April. Now throughout this process, remember now we had not seen anything like this uh, for uh, uh, over 100 years. So um, there was nothing in place uh, no infrastructure to deal with it. So throughout this process, we had to build an infrastructure for vaccination and increase the capacity and efficiency for identifying and tracing of the virus. Uh, to that end, we, hired, uh, we set up pods uh, 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 here at City Hall and at our rec centers. We also hired a new uh, medical director. We filled and added uh, critical staff positions in the health department. We reorganized the epidemiology uh, unit at the health department. We assigned uh, the health department to the prevention intervention uh, an opportunity cluster. And then we went to other departments throughout the city of Cleveland and we brought them together and their resources to help the health department with this new infrastructure we created to combat the, uh, the pandemic. And as of October 4th, almost 40% of all Clevelanders, that's October 4th of this year, uh, almost all, uh, almost 40% of all Clevelanders have been fully vaccinated. Now, I will remind you how 40% is not the best in the world. And I will remind you, however, that the pandemic is not over. We have to continue the effort to get more people fully vaccinated and emphasize the need to continue preventive measures. Now, the politicization of this pandemic has made that job much, much harder, believe me. And without federal and state policy and leadership, 
it will only get worse. The conversation is good, you know, everybody likes to talk, but they ain't doing nothing, so the con is going to get worse. Now, now, let me just say, now I have addressed five areas and only a portion of each of those areas, right? Uh, financial stability, public safety, education, positioning for the future, and health. Now, this has been my longest state of the city address. <laughs> but believe me, ladies and gentlemen, it could be long. <laughs> And, and, uh, and the reason for that is, well, there's a lot of reasons, but because I have only addressed a fraction, just a fraction, of what it takes to run this city. And this, and I want this is just a sampling, just a sampling of the many moving parts of a dynamic institution that we call the city. And it will not be sustainable if we do not become a great city. A city that addresses the core issues of institutionalized inequities, disparities, and racism. Now we have attempted to address this over the last 16 years by creating, among other things, the Fannie Lewis Law that ensured cleaners uh, had job opportunity, particularly on, on construction jobs. We enforced our Office of Equal Opportunity Laws for contracts for minorities, uh, uh, small businesses, and Cleveland-based businesses as well as attempted to decouple these huge contracts to give people more opportunities. And most recently, we established a new division of health equity and social justice that has the purpose and the mission to analyze and develop approaches to address institutionalized inequities, disparities, and racism. We also designated racism as a public health issue. Right. Now these, these, these are just a few examples, and, 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 and there are a few examples that you can hold up, but this is inf infrastructure that I mentioned and other things that we've done, however, will only be successful and can only be sustainable with the commitment and leadership of whoever the mayor is, whoever the council is, our business community, and our philanthropic community, all of us. And it will not be easy, believe me. But it must be done. So yes, we are a successful city. And yes, we are well positioned for the future. And we, yes, we have faced and overcome many, many challenges and hard times. But this will all change with the next crisis if we don't handle it properly. And it will fail, and it will fail if we do not become a great city. Now I have run my leg of this relay. I've run my leg. Yes, sir. And much has been done. <laughs> but there's so much more to be done. So much more. And whatever I have accomplished, whatever I have accomplished, I have not done that on my own. So I do owe some thank yous. So I would like for you to give me, as I close, a moment to say thank you. Just thank you. Let me first thank my cabinet. You know, because, um, 
You know, I, I, I tell them all the time, I don't, when I fuss with them too, I fuss with them. Uh, I tell them, I say, look, I don't have the luxury of a task. I wish I did. I don't have the luxury to start something, a top start a task and to complete it. I have decisions to make and I have to move on. So I task other people. I task my directors, I task my, my cabinet. And they have stepped forward. They've done it through operation efficiency so that we can have, see how we can begin to do more with less because we didn't have enough revenue coming in to support our budget and we didn't want to cut service and lay people off. They did it with figuring out our budget and how to best maneuver and do things in a way that we can have a balanced budget and deliver our bottom line to the people of this city, which was service. They did it when our roles were just messed up and we worked with the council president to develop a new approach to residential resurface and put more money in it. They did it. They're the ones who did, who I tasked to do these things. And because I couldn't do it myself. Not only because it was so much and I didn't have the luxury, I didn't have the knowledge. But they did. So I want to thank them. I want to thank them. City employees, I want to thank you. You know, uh, sometimes I hear people talk about city employees and, 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 and what they don't do, but they really don't know what they're talking about. You know, you, you, you know, you can't, you can't, you can't consider, you don't, don't, you can't be critical of the player unless you can play the game, right? And I tell everybody, I tell everybody, that public service is an honorable profession. Yes, sir. But it's not made for everybody. Everybody can't do this. But those who do it, and do it right, have the greatest opportunity to impact the lives of individuals, families, and communities. So thank you, City of Columbia. You know, my, my wife couldn't, I guess some family members here, but my wife couldn't be here tonight. And so but she's watching this on, on Channel 20. Amen. And she told me, Amen. you know, we've been together for about 50 years. Right. Uh, she married for about uh, 47 of those years, you know. I guess we Shaq a little bit too. <laughs> But she told me, and she's listening, so I might have to do it. <clears throat> she wanted me to say to you that it was an honor for her to meet many of you. And she also wanted me to say thank you for your support and your help to her husband, me, <laughs> to help other people. But I do want to, uh, I do want to uh, thank my family because it's not easy living in the bubble. And uh, particularly with children. It's not easy growing up in a bubble when you're judged and, 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 and by many different standards and having to live in the challenges that you have to live in 
and the environment that you have to be brought up in and judged by that. So it hasn't been easy. So I thank you. I thank you. Because they always, no matter what happened, no matter what happened, they was always on my side. And then finally, I want to just thank you, whoever you are. Whether I mentioned you or not, whether you were supporters or not, whether you voted for me or not, I want to thank you. And I want to say to you that it was my honor and privilege to serve as your mayor for 16 years. And I will say this to, you know, a lot of people look at um, uh, supporters and they, they say, well, uh, you know, uh, I will, this is honest God fact. All of my four supporters, whether they were business people, supported me financially in campaigns, or, or they, they were just regular people out in the street, let me just say to you that never once did anyone ask me to do something that they knew was improper for me to do. All right. And I thank you. But, you know, um, I'm, gonna try, I'm trying to wrap this up, but I want to, um, in this thank you, you know, I, People may ask me constantly, um, what advice would I give them to run for public office or councilman or mayor or something like that? And I would tell them several things. I would say, first of all, don't play the game before you know the game. Because, because it, it, it ain't no chump game. If you get in there, you're going to get creamy. So, so learn, learn your trade, you know, get, get some, some, learn something before you come here, right? You know, but also, I tell them that when you come, come with a purpose. Because if you come to this game, it is all about being a mayor. It's all about being a counselor and the trappings that are, are, are that the luxuries around that, then you will be vulnerable to manipulation. And not only that, you will make decisions while professing one thing, but you will do another thing to cover your political behind. Because you need to preserve yourself in that position. But if you come here for a purpose, then you serve that purpose regardless of where it goes. And if you stay on that purpose, then what you'll find is that you won't be always popular. But you will be there for the reason that you're there. And that these positions are not positions to hold as an end product or something that so you can say I am. These positions are only a tool for you to use to accomplish that purpose. Yes, sir. And then, uh, and then uh, I can't leave without saying it is what it is. <laughs> My man! So, I, um, um, you know, people think when I say it is what it is, it's some fatalistic thing, as if, um, as if um, there's nothing you can do about it. Well, again, um, they come from a different world than I come from. When I say it is what it is, what I mean is I have to accept reality no matter how painful it is.
Because if I'm going to fulfill that purpose for which I'm here, and use this tool of marriage to fulfill that purpose, I cannot be making decisions and living in an illusion. Because if I do, then I will make decisions that will not resolve the issues at hand. But if I accept it, it is what it is, and I grapple with it, then I'm able to make changes in regards to substantive changes and sustainable changes in regards to those things that we need to address in order to improve the quality of life of people. So I want to tell you that thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to be your mayor. Thank you. Thank you. And from my family, I want to thank you for your kindness and your prayers during our bereavement. And you, as Clevelanders and greater Clevelanders, you have an opportunity now to set the direction of this city and create a trajectory that no one else can change if we become a great city. So thank you very much. This is Gary H. Gardner, M.I.I., M.I. Leonard, no DJ Booker, and this is the city, all over the city, last one by Mayor Frank Jackson. Where we've already started today, November 2nd is the general election for the mayor.